Thank you so much. Uh, First few things we got to get out of the way before we start. One is that if you're tuning in, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, the audience here uh, are test subjects and uh, torture ease. We're greatly appreciated. What's great is that none of these guys have families or jobs or real, uh, real expectations at home. So being here represents an enormous uh, time commitment on their part and your part. But it's a part of a big experiment. And before I introduce myself, I need to, need to talk about a few things and get a few things straight. One is that. Creative Live represents, mm, I would say, the greatest social experiment maybe I've been a part of. Where we think, and, and, if, and as I was thinking about how to kind of program this or talk about this, um, it came to me when some of the producers asked me to create a reading list. And uh, as I was doing this reading list for my wife, she was like, there's a lot of sci-fi on this reading list. I'm like, well, yeah, that's really what people should read if they're going to understand my kinetic brain. And uh, so. One of the concepts here is that we're living in an epoch. It's a renaissance. For the first time in the history of the world, we have disparate, unsiloed access to so many uh, different cross disciplines. We have, you know, a gymnast like Carl Powley, who's going to be on, talking to the world's best powerlifters like Mark Bell and Jesse Burdick, talking to elite coaches in rowing, talking to super athletes, talking to yogis, talking to, you know, uh, genius physicians. And for the first time, I feel like we have a chance of getting this right. And look, I mean, let's be clear about what's going on here. For thousands of years, we're not any smarter than the people before us, right? Maybe we are. Maybe we're, you know, maybe we're a little bit more integrated and in best practices, but people have been really taking a crack at this about improving the human condition for a long time. And as an example, you know, I'm pretty sure that about 2,000 years ago in some of the early yogic texts, they were talking about how to get your shoulders organized, yes? Right? And maybe when you put your arms over your head, you were aligning the chakras, maybe. Or maybe you were just organizing your shoulder into a stable position. Ah, it's maybe that we'd figured this out, but that these kind of pockets of embodied knowledge have gone away. Why? Because we didn't have the YouTubes. We didn't have the internets. And we didn't have this technology to be able to share and sort of reconcile all of these brilliant, incredible um, bastions of knowledge and experience. 350 years ago, um, Musashi, uh, was this Japanese swordsman who wrote the Book of the Five Rings. Have you guys heard of this book? It's a pretty important book. Excellent. Plus one for you. <laughs> one extra supple point. And what happened was he said, hey, 350 years ago, he's like, hey, where your short sword goes, your belly needs to be firm. Obviously, he's talking about your core. Get your core tight, you know, which is weird because that translates strangely into feudal Japanese as like hara or something, right? But uh, he figured it out. Like, you need to have your belly tight. And he's like, from your knees to your feet, you need to create tension. Well, what was that about? We know what that was about. It was about talking about creating torque and stabilizing the back. And more importantly, he said, make your combat stance your everyday stance. And one of the things is, if this guy, 350 years ago, was just writing about his experience being a Japanese swordsman, that the universal truths of how to be organized as a human being have been laid out for us. But for the first time, we can sort of integrate all of these concepts. We can put all of the data together and all the information together. And if we don't get it right this time, we've blown it. It's up to us. And so. What's amazing about Creative Live, and this is where this comes from, is when they asked me to create a, a, a book list, one of the books on there that uh, I didn't list but should list is called um, Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age. Now, I have two daughters. Some of you guys know this. And what I'm always working on with them is sort of this concept that came out of the book. And the book is, happens. It's a postmodern kind of industrial society where technology is really taking these advances forward. And what's happened is that um, the castes that own the technology have really sort of gone and become what they call neo-Victorian. And the idea was that like in, in reaction to our easy modern ways here with advertising and, and tight-fitting jeans, right, skinny jeans, the, uh, not skinny jeans, the idea is that they, were, they kind of created this formal society. And what they found was that the kids coming through the process of this formal society, their schooling, were a perfect product of the system. And the gentleman who was in charge of this kind of society's cast realized that what he needed to do was create kids who, and, who were perfect products of the system, yet could highly disrupt the system. And so he created this thing called the primer for girls. And so personally, for me, I'm trying to always raise my daughters to say, hey, this is what the system is. You have to get straight A's. You have to be polite. But at the same time, you need to be working to sort of undercut the system, undermine, find the corners. How, how can we have disruptive technology 
How can we practice the limits of our understanding so that we can evolve and continue to kind of press forward, right? So it's a, it's a, for me as a parent, I mean, it's a very crazy concept. I'm like, hey, you need to be a perfect student and you need to try to undermine the authority of your teacher all the time, right? So that you can create a life that, that you can live that has meaning for you. So let's take that concept, this primer concept. And when Creative Life said, hey, Kelly, are you interested in doing a course for us? I was like, hell yes. And the reason is, what we think we can do in the next two days is create a primer for basic human movement. This is what happens and what, how much you should know and all of the integrated concepts in one piece. Imagine you have the most extraordinary set of software, the brain, on top of the most extraordinary set of hardware ever, ever created. In two and a half million years you've been evolving. In the last 10,000 years you really haven't changed that much. You know, your femur is a little bit longer, you're a little fatter. It's true. And, uh, but otherwise, you're the same human being. So who taught you to sit? Who taught you to stand? Who taught you to run? Sort of the things that we take for granted. And what's been happening is that we've been sort of been spending our genetic inheritance regularly. What, what, what we've been doing, and we'll talk about adaptation in a second, is we've been sort of just saying, well, it's working. We're good to go. And those of you in the audience can recognize that what we're seeing is that you're designed to be 110 years old. That's, that is how extraordinary the physiology of the human being is, and very robust. But guess what? The resting state of the human being is pain-free. So let me ask you this question. How many of you guys in the audience are pain-free? Raise your hands. I'm sorry, you guys didn't understand the question. Raise your hand if you're pain-free. So what's going on there, right? Because we have this concept that if you have a right lifestyle, you know how to eat, you know how to sleep, you're getting enough, you're not totally stressed, you know, you're not eating great military food on a deployed, stressful, you know, deployment on a ship, right? Comma, you move correctly, and what we see is that your body has an almost miraculous capacity to spontaneously and continuously heal itself, right? And I'm, I'm not talking about miracle cures, I'm talking about that, like, you're a pretty remarkable self-repairing person. If you get a cut when you're 90, your skin still heals, and so what's going on? How come we're making these basic adaptation errors? How come we're making these kind of basic mistakes in our understanding about how we, how we organize and how we move? And so here's the first task we're gonna do. If you're playing along in the internet land and for all time in this primer, right, we're gonna turn this into a drinking game for you at home. Is that any time you guys see these guys slouch, you have to do a shot. Does that seem fair? A shot of wheatgrass, a shot of, of goat blood, of something, right? It can, be, it can be totally paleo, whatever you need to do, right? But the concept here is we need to be able to connect the dots and make our combat stance our everyday stance. And really what's the problem is is that we think, oh, it's the exercise. And what's happening, or the training that I'm doing, it's the fighting, it's the engagement. What's happening is we don't have a basic schema and template about how to get organized, about how to put my body into a better position, about how to be able to perform basic maintenance on myself. This is a human right. These are the things that we should be teaching in our schools. This is what we should be, you know, as our, as our embodied inheritance. When you have knee pain and you go see your doctor, right, and the doctor's like, hey, you've worn a hole in your knee. And you're like, what? And the doctor very reasonably is like, hey, look, that bone in her head, she's like, that bone is designed to be 110 years old, and you're 22, and there's a hole in your kneecap. And you, you, maybe you should stop running. And you're like, you can't keep me down. I'm a runner. I express myself through running, right? And people freak out about this, right? Because the physician's saying very something reasonable. Hey, I'm not sure you're moving very well. I've noticed that you've worn a hole in a system that's designed to be there for your whole life. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that is the poorest, worst use of a physician services of all time is that you've, you basically have caused an immense amount of damage because you don't understand how to move and you don't understand how to identify how to, how to protect yourself. So on my reading list, right, is this first book is called Dune. And raise your hands if you've read Dune. Oh, little marks in the back. Some of you, we're going to have to do some remedial catch up tonight, okay? But there's a scene where the young Paul Atreides, who is the chosen one, is being tested by the Bene Gesserit witch. And she's like, she's going to find out if he is a human being or not, right? Because this is what we're really deciding about. Am I responsible enough to take care of this machine so that I can live an extraordinary pain-free life? And can I take on the mantle and uh, the onus, the responsibility of being able to do this basic maintenance on this self? So she says, put your hand in this box. And he's like, what's in the box? And she says, pain. This really creepy voice, right? And uh, he sticks his hand in the box. He's going to be tested. 
And uh, she holds this needle at his neck called the Gom Jabbar, right? And she's like, if you take your hand on the box, I will kill you, which is a very reasonable thing to say. And uh, so she starts to melt his hand with her brain, right? And it's a David Lynch movie, so you can understand what's going on. And uh, the, the flesh is burning off his hand. He's freaking out, but he's got to keep the hand in the box so that he doesn't choose to die. And at the end, she's like, I can't take it. And he pulls his hand out. You know, she's like, take your hand out of the box. And it's just his hand, right? And she's like, she's like, pull your hand from the box, human. And she's like, the test is crisis. The test is, can you decide and choose to be a human being? Can you decide to not be an animal and just pull your hand out of the box because you had this noxious stimuli, but can you consciously make a better decision? And that's what this is really about today, is that this conscious, for the next two days, we're going to try to have people change their consciousness about how they're moving, how they're, how they're eating a little bit, and, and what to do about these things when we're finding problems in the system, because you should have a basic template for that, because it's your decision not to just be run your machine into the ground till it fails. We know that these are problems that have been plaguing human beings forever. If we look at the, the data on back pain in America, it's a billion dollar problem. The World Health Organization has phenomenal statistics on this. If we look at the Army, the Army has a million orthopedic injury uses a year that are non-combat related. Uh, I have some friends for the, from the uh, School of Infantry, Marine Force Recon. 85% of those tactical athletes retire on disability, 85%. So what we're seeing is that in the universities, we have 18 to 22 year old kids, super jocks coming in. Don't worry, when you're 22, there's another kid coming behind you to take your place. And what we've done is we've sort of built this concept and notion on, hey, don't worry, we can spend your genetics long enough and then when you're broken, someone else will come and take your place. But what we're finding is that this is really not a conversation about performance or maintenance and being pain, pain-free, what we find, and this is an important concept, is that I'm a clinic, I have a clinical doctor in physical therapy, and there's never a compromise between being in the safest position and being in the best position and having the best joint congruency and the best tissue loading and the tissue health and going the fastest. And what we want to do here today is sort of link all of those dots, that who I am in the world manifests itself all the time. How I'm standing, how I'm organized, what's, you know, how I sit, how I pick up my kid out of the crib, how I hold my babies, right? All of these things sort of aggregate into what happens then when I express myself as a human being, which is movement, sport, dance, sitting, uh, I'm a creative person and I'm holding my camera. How do we do that? And what we're gonna need to do is that this is a two-day course. The first day is gonna be all about movement. Because what we find is that people are making basic movement errors all day long. What I hope to happen is that once you have seen this course going on a little bit, it's going to be like taking a handful of the blue pills in the matrix. I think it's the blue pills, right? And you're going to wake up, the sleeper must awaken, and you're going to have a choice about either seeing the world as half broken, which is a really difficult way to operate, or half unbroken. And what you're going to see is how poorly people move around you and how we just sort of take that for granted. How you're sitting, how you're, how you're standing, how you pick things up, how you run. What we tend to do is make these basic assumptions that if I said to you guys, get tight, ready? Get tight. What, what does that mean? Flex your core, fire your cobra hood, like, you know, <laughs> flex your beach muscles. And I just saw 10 different iterations out there. You're like, I get tight, I don't squeeze my butt, what do I do? And what we need to do is that this stuff needs to be observable, measurable, and repeatable phenomenon. We need a precise schema for, for getting the best physiology of the human being. Now, I own a CrossFit gym. It's called San Francisco CrossFit. I'm an early adopter. We look at our gym as the laboratory. That the idea is that since we've been open, we imagine we've had, estimate, we've had 80,000 athletes, athlete sessions in our gym, which is an immense amount of pattern recognition. Like we can pull out all of the little problems. And what we found was that we were seeing all of the lies, all the tight hips, all of the baby holding, all the sprained ankles, all of the, the we found it all, right? It was this great diagnostic tool. And what also I found was that people didn't have a basic template for having to do maintenance or understanding what was going on. And I was having to undo all of this stuff during the course of basic training. 
And so what's happened now is that some of these ideas as a phys working physio, as owning a gym with a lab, of going around the world and teaching is that if we can create this two-day body of knowledge of the basics about day-to-day -day life, then we can really create a template for athletes and tactical athletes to go through training, for kids to be in sport, for, you know, for people to be able to compete, for people to be able to train well, and then suddenly we can advance the conversation. Like that street song, let's push things forward. That's what this is really going to be about today. So the first day is about movement. And we've got an extraordinary day. We're going to talk about some theory. We're going to get organized a little bit about in terms of having a, a cogent schema about what we're going to fix. We'll work our way through this. Um, and then we'll do some actual movement so we can see it where the rubber hits the road. Because to talk of bulls is not the same thing as to be in the bull ring, is it? And so we'll, we'll get into that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have Jill Miller as our first guest. And Jill Miller is, if I could have a twin, and she was cute and smart, <laughs> cuter and smarter, and a woman version of myself, it would be Jill Miller, right? She's like my soul sister. And uh, she is uh, a brilliant thinker in the space of fascia and the space of connective tissue and kind of self-care and self-embodiment. You know, if you talk to her, she's like, why, why don't you have your loci of control organized? Like she's, you know, she's about empowerment, right? You should be able to do this yourself. And then she's also a brilliant yoga teacher, which is also a formalized system of movement. And what's nice about the way we're going to talk today is that if you start to understand these principles, if you know how to organize your spine and understand these basic kind of schema and, and model, then suddenly you can apply that to any situation. How to pick up my kid, how to drive in my car, how to not survive the, how to survive the helicopter, how to you know, be on the boat and not get crushed. And that's what's great about this. Suddenly you don't become an expert in one field, you become an expert in every field. And I should tell this quick story because... When I was in Australia with my wife a year ago, um, just about my relationship with yoga, when I was 20 years old, I may or may not have lived in Kathmandu a little bit and done some yoga, but um, we were in Australia about a year ago, and my, we were staying in a nice spot, and Juliet was like, hey, you should go take this yoga class. It'll be entertaining for you and entertaining for them. <laughs> so I showed up at the appropriate time, and uh, there's like 15 people in their yoga costumes, right? Women who look like they're doing yoga, you know, and the instructor is, you know, not what I would call the embodiment of fitness, right? She looks a little puffy to me, you know, she's not really strong, but she looks at me, and of course I'm her worst nightmare. I walk in at the appropriate time, but I'm basically late, and she's like, F. Like, you know, and you can see her just deflate, like, oh, I have these, these women, and they know what they're doing, and I have this fat football guy in the background, right? And this condescending voice, she's like, well, have you ever done yoga before? You know, and I was like, Oh, it's on. <laughs> Have I done yoga? And I was like, a little. I'll just be in the back. And uh, not that uh, yoga is a competitive sport, but blah, I was like bringing the heat and uh, trying to school those girls. So what ends up happening is about 10, 20 minutes in, she's like, good job in the back. Whoa, in the back. What, what are you doing? That's amazing. Whoa. You know, and obviously she can't. She's having some cognitive dissonance. And right after the class, and I know these women are turning around and they're like, what's going on in the back? And what's going on in the back is I'm winning, right? <laughs> and uh, at the end of the class, she runs up to me and she's like, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. She's like, obviously you have a yoga practice and I, I misjudged you. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, I don't, I'm an endurance athlete, I get it, right? And she, uh, she looks at me and she's like, so do you practice yoga? I'm like, where do you practice? You know? And I was like, oh, I don't practice yoga, ever. She's like, well, what do you do? And I said, I lift heavy weights. Have a nice day. And the idea is that if you understand the basic schema, then you understand what Buckminster Fuller called this concept of mutual accommodation. That all correct systems are integrated. That you don't have to discard one piece. And that there have been movement systems from the dawn of time. People have worked out the details for us. And what's nice is that when you start to understand the underlying principles, because the shoulder is the shoulder, however it's being applied across any sport or movement platform, the, the back is the back, and suddenly you become an expert in everything. And so when we start thinking about that, it's fun to jump into a yoga class because I understand the principles of yoga. And I understand what's trying to go on. I've got to maintain a stable shoulder and a stable spine. And boy, that looks a lot like snatching to me, and that looks a lot like efficient running mechanics. And so that there's not an integration or disintegration. So what we have is this idea of this primer. So we're going to bring Jill Miller on. We're going to talk about some of the biggest errors we see 
in the, in the human body this morning, and that's this breathing mechanic as it relates to your spine and global stabilization, because when people are making movement errors, they don't breathe very well, and this causes a whole host of problems. In fact, in the, in the real world right now, there's a lot of talk looking on about this, this kind of breathing capacity, breathing mechanics in the strength and conditioning world. So we're finding out that athletes have huge lungs, and they don't use very much of their lungs, and we're gonna show you why. And it also turns out that this diaphragm also is strangely connected to and related to the diaphragm in your pelvic floor. And those are weird diaphragms related in the same system. And if one is not working, tends the other one doesn't work. And suddenly we have a model for working on pelvic floor dysfunction. We have a model for women who've carried babies or men who've had back pain and aren't getting their pelvic floor on. Right? It's not just an issue of keggling or kegling more. It's an issue of you need to be in a good position. So we're going to be able to work on that. We're going to get into lunch and then after do some movement. And then this afternoon we have Carl Pally coming today. Carl Pally is one of the foremost experts in freestyle movement and athletic movement on the planet. He, uh, he's one of my best friends, and uh, he's pretty and popular, and I hate him for it, right? And he's, he's really a brilliant coach and thinker. And what's nice is that we use the same set of language. So what you're going to see is that we're going to start to apply the set of movement principles as we spin up in some of the basic movements getting up off the ground, picking things up, how do we apply that to a little bit more freestyle movement, not the sort of the formality of, of squatting and moving. Um, tomorrow, we'll get into the mobility aspect of this. So what is, how do you fix it? What's it look like? Because if you don't know what to fix, then you're already sort of playing this game of press and guess all the time. And that press and guess model is tired. It just doesn't work. So what we need to do is understand what we're going to fix first, and then tomorrow is dedicated to uh, Working through, make sure we're fixing diet and nutrition with Jim Keen in the morning. The, in the morning. He's the founder of Wellness Effects. Um, it turns out that I'm deeply, deeply enamored with this concept of observable, measurable, and repeatable phenomenon. You need to be able to measure it and quantify, right? And that doesn't mean you need to count how many steps you take every single day of every single moment. But if you can't prove that it's working, for me, this is sort of a problem, right? And one of the assumptions that we make about lifestyle is that, hey, I'm eating right. Woo, I only had bacon and no carbs this morning, right? Bacon and coffee. Well, how do we know that works? Well, we take a look at your blood chemistry. And blood chemistry is how we measure lifestyle and nutrition. Because you can tell a whole bunch of lies to yourself, but when we bore down on the real stuff, it turns out that if you got less than six hours of sleep, raise your hand. Did you get any less than six hours of sleep? Well, that's just most of you, no big deal. You're 30% immune compromised today. whoop do you do And you're pre-diabetic for the next 24 hours. So it doesn't matter how you're eating because your blood sugar is raised. And then when you have that glass of wine and a cookie, because this is the things that make me go on in life, uh, there are certain times where I probably shouldn't do that, like when I've been traveling. Right? So how do I manage that? You know, for our tactical athletes coming back from, from austere environments, not getting a lot of water, sleeping in bad positions, right? underneath enormous stress, um, I think the nutrition, the MRE, is really a paradigm of how you should eat as a human being. Is that correct? That meal ready to eat, that bag of processed food. Right? You might get one MRE for the next two days or the next 24 hours. It's 3,000 calories. And so what we see is that we're making these basic errors in how the human should be moving, and we need to talk about that. We'll bring Jill back out. And then this afternoon, for tomorrow, and then the afternoon to wrap us up, we have Brian McKenzie, who is the creator and founder of CrossFit Endurance. And Brian is a premier, one of the most technical running coaches understanding about running and moving in the environment. He's a brilliant strength coach, but when we talk about how to run, and I'll tell a little story tomorrow about my revelation about the fact that I was the, one of the best athletes I knew, but ran very, very poorly. And uh, when Brian brought that to light, I became a believer. And uh, so we can start to integrate these things into, again, the fundamental ideas. This is what human beings should be able to do. And uh, so we have two days. And I'm already behind. I'm freaking out a little bit because we have so much to talk about. And we want to make sure that we've got you guys on tap so that we can talk and answer the questions because the questions you have are the questions everyone else have. Our moderators in the back are like Vid Virgil. Was Virgil was leading Dante through the, the, the levels of hell? Right, so Virgils. I have two Virgils because I'm so lost. And so hopefully you guys can be our interface between the interwebs and uh, what's going on. And we want to really turn this into an open laboratory school environment.